Living Word is brought to you by International Central Gospel Church. message I've titled my message winning with the word winning with the word after you've received the word what do you do and that's what I'm going to walk you through today turn with me in your Bibles to first Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 18 are you in first Timothy okay chapter 1 verse 18 this is what the Apostle Paul spoke to Timothy, who was a young man who was rising up in ministry, a young man who wanted to obey and, and, and honor God with his life. And this is what uh, the Apostle said. He says, This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare that by them you may wage the good warfare. God wants us to face life on his terms, not on our own terms. He wants us to face life on the basis of his word. And he wants us to build our foundation on the authority of his word. When you receive a word, there are four things that can happen to the word. First, say sometimes the word falls by the wayside. People don't pay clear attention. They think they've heard, but they haven't really heard or they don't focus well. And the Bible says they lose it. Instantly, they just disconnect from the word. Then there are those who receive the word and they rejoice, they're excited because the word has come. But they have no depth. The word didn't come with depth. So when, when things begin to go wrong or things don't go the way they expect it to go, they give up. Then there are those who begin to grow, things are going all right, and then things, thorns choke them and they die. Then there is a seed that falls on good ground that bears fruit. So there are four things that can happen to the word. You can lose it instantly, you can receive it but have no depth, and so you can grow much, or you can start growing and pressure comes upon you and you lose the authority of the word. Or it falls on good ground and it bears fruit. So every prophetic word can land in four areas. Every prophetic word, no matter how profound it is, it can end up in four ways. There can be four different ways of receiving the word of God. That means that a quarter of the people probably will hear the word and already have lost it. Some probably heard the word, they think they've understood it, but they have no depth. Some heard the word, they're excited, but when things don't go the way they expect it to, then they get discouraged, and then there are those who really hold on to the word and bear fruit. I believe you are of those who bear fruit. I'm going to take you through the scripture to show you a picture of how some of these things work in real life. So go with me to the book of Ezra. Now, the book of Ezra like the book of Nehemiah, uh, occurred at the time Israel is returning from captivity or they're in captivity and they're trying to get back to the land. And uh, it was a very difficult moment because they had been taken as slaves. Uh, they've gone to Persia. They've gone to Babylon. Uh, their land is desecrated. The temple is gone. The walls are broken down. Buildings are broken down. Most of the people have left some into slavery. Some have just left on their own. But they receive a word and they go back. And they go in different faces. But it's a very difficult situation because they go and look at their land and everything is destroyed. No hope. 
And the people who are left are living in idolatry. They've forgotten about God. And, and, and just, it's, it's a, just a picture of depression. But God raises up people to go and fix the problem. And uh, in doing that, God also used the kings of the nations that had taken them captive to supply their need. Now this is Ezra's account of some of the things that happened to help them, to encourage them to build in a very hopeless situation. So let's read Ezra's account. Ezra chapter 6, verse 13 to 15. Ezra 6, 13 to 15. It says, Then Tatinai, governor of the region, beyond the river, Sheta Boznai, these are interesting names, and their companions diligently did according to what King Darius had sent. So the elders of the Jews built and they prospered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zachariah the son of Edo. And they built and finished it according to the command of the God of Israel and according to the command of Cyrus, Darius and Artaxerxes king of Persia. Now the temple was finished on the third day of the month of Adar, which was in the sixth year of the reign of King Darius. There are three entities mentioned in this passage who facilitated the building process. Now remember they get to this place and nothing seems to be working. They are returning to a land in poverty, they have no money. And the Bible mentions three entities that facilitate this, facilitated this process. The first one is the God of Israel. The God of Israel. The Bible says they, they did it according to the commandment of the God of Israel. God is the one who establishes his purpose. In every situation, every prophetic situation, there is the purpose of God which is established in heaven. Now remember, God is his own counsel. He determines by himself what he would do. He holds the times and seasons of the universe in himself and orders all things according to his will. God commands it. Now how did he command it? He does it in heaven, in the realm of the spirit. So at a certain time, God says, it's time. And if you read the, the rest of the story, God had actually told them when they were going to go into captivity and when they were going to come out of captivity. So when the right time comes, God decrees it. It's time to go back and build Jerusalem. So God is the first entity that is critical for every process of restoration or for winning in this life God the God of Israel then the second is the prophets the Bible mentions two of them Haggai and Zachariah God establishes his purpose prophets reveal God's purposes what God conceives in secret he reveals to us through his servants Amos chapter 3, verse 7 and, says, 7 and 8 says, Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. A lion has roared who would not fear. The Lord has spoken who can but prophesy. So God speaks and others amplify his word. They prophesy. Now, I want you to just have... Um, this understanding. A prophecy, um, now I know that in Ghana we are used to a certain kind of ministry we call prophetic ministry. And uh, it comes in a certain form. Uh, your name is mentioned and things are spoken about you and that's what we consider prophetic. And yes, it, that is part of the prophetic. 
but it's not the entirety of the prophetic. So a prophecy does not always have to come specifically mention you by name, tell you which house you lived in, and so on and so forth. That is part, but it's not all. The greater prophetic word is a declaration of God's intention. And so when Zechariah and Haggai spoke these words, they were declaring God's intention. And most of the time, the greater prophetic word comes in the natural course of what we call preaching. So a person is preaching, and at a certain point, he is making a declaration, and that declaration is a revelation of God's intent. And that is a prophetic declaration, a prophetic word. A prophetic word pulls that which is in the realm of the spirit and brings them into the realm of the physical. It takes that which is in the spirit and makes it available in the realm of the physical. Third group, or the third entity, is the king. Kings, and in the passage we read, three are mentioned. Cyrus, Darius, Artaxerxes. Kings. What do the kings do? They facilitate God's purposes. They facilitate God's purposes. So God establishes his purposes. The prophets reveal his purposes. The kings facilitate the purposes. The prophet does not facilitate the purpose. The prophet declares it, reveals it. The king is the one who facilitates it. So in this account, it's very interesting that God uses three kings who are heathen. They are not godly people. They are not Jews. They are not in covenant with God. They worship other gods and other idols. But in Isaiah chapter 45, God describes one of the, those guys as his anointed. God calls Cyrus, my anointed. And he says to Cyrus, I will subdue nations before him. He says, I will open to him the treasures of secret places. In fact, it's a scripture that most believers claim for themselves. But it was not a prophecy to a believer. It was to an unbeliever, an unbelieving king, Cyrus. Now, why would God call an unbeliever my anointed? Why? Can an unbeliever be, not, be anointed? Yes. What does it mean? Anointed simply means empowered and equipped. Empowered and equipped. Empowered and equipped. Can God empower an unbeliever? Yes. Why would he do it? For the sake of the righteous. So God wants to bless Israel. Israel is going to go back poor with no resources and God says I will anoint Cyrus the king who is supposed to be your enemy he's going to come under my anointing and he will receive a word from me that will make him transfer wealth to you so if you read the account Cyrus writes letters and releases a lot of money to the Israelites to the Jews so they can go back and build their land so a king an unbeliever is used by God when God establishes his purpose, the prophets reveal his purpose. He looks for any available vessel and he uses him for his glory. And so in this season of open fields, you can expect that there will be a Cyrus that will be anointed for you. He doesn't have to like you. He doesn't have to even have your interests at heart. If anything, Cyrus should not be interested in releasing slaves he has inherited. He's supposed to keep them. In those days, slaves were a huge resource for a nation. They were the labor force. They were the task force. They were the people that the king needed. And if you have slaves, you don't release them. So how come Cyrus is releasing them? Because God has anointed him for that purpose. 
God is able to anoint people, the most unlikely persons, and use them for your glory. People who don't like you will like you. People who must punish you will begin to favor you. People who yesterday said, over my dead body, will rise up the next morning and start making decrees to your favor. Because when God anoints Cyrus, Cyrus has no choice but to honor God and obey God. So Cyrus is going out and he's conquering nations. Why? Because God anointed him. The Babylonians were not going to release the Israelites. They are taking them captive. So how does God get Israel out? He anoints another unbeliever king Cyrus of Persia and they go out and they conquer the Babylonians and tell the Jews, go home. God is able to use the most unlikely people. He fed Elijah with vultures. Vultures. He used vultures to feed Elijah. Animals which don't give food. When they take food, they don't release it. God anoints the animal and instead of keeping the food, it begins to become a giver. May God cause people to give to you. So, we find God establishes his word. Everybody say God establishes his purposes. The prophet release, re reveals it. The king facilitates it. Kings are influential people. The people of authority. People in high places. People who have effect. And they are able to make the word of God a reality. So the Bible says they, they prospered through the prophesying of Haggai and Zechariah. So we want to look at the two prophets and what they said to the children of God. So let's look first at Haggai's word, Haggai's prophecy. What did Haggai say? His prophecy is in Haggai chapter 2 from verse 4 onwards. Actually, it's not just chapter 2. It's the whole book of Haggai and we've done a study on that before. But this is part of what Haggai said. He says, Yet now be strong Zerubbabel, says the Lord, and be strong Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and be strong all you people of the land, says the Lord, and work for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. According to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you. Do not fear, for thus says the Lord of hosts, once more it is a little while I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and dry land. I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations. And I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine says the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. It's very interesting that almost after every statement, you hear the phrase, says the Lord of hosts, says the Lord of hosts. Uh, the Lord of hosts means the Lord of the battle, the Lord of the army. Uh, so when, when God... It's not always that God says, that I'm the Lord of hosts. But when he says the Lord of hosts, then he's talking about spiritual warfare. So what did Haggai say? What did he say was going to happen? First, he says there's going to be a shaking. Everybody say a shaking. He says there's going to be a shaking of the systems. When God wants to bring you to the place that he wants you to be, there has to be a shaking. You cannot enter your open fields just like that. Because while the field is open to you, it's closing to somebody. While the field is open to you, somebody was there ahead of time. And until there is a shaking, the person is going to stay there permanently. So there is a shaking. Everybody say shaking. shaking. So first, there is a shaking of the system. Secondly, there is a transfer of wealth and resources. As a result of the shaking, there is going to be a transfer of wealth and resources. People and places which had in the past been repositories of wealth and resources, would be dislodged. 
Because God says, the silver is mine and the gold is mine. That's why he's able to transfer wealth because the silver is his and the gold is his. Everybody who has money is borrowed the money from God. Nobody is rich by themselves. No human being brought money. Nobody creates money. The base for all our wealth is gold. Even now, the base for the whole wealth of the world is gold. Paper money is useless without gold, real resource backing it. God says the silver is mine and the gold is mine. So everybody who has money has borrowed it from God. And because it is God's resource primarily, he can give it to whomever he pleases. And the third thing that Haggai said was going to happen is that there was going to be a testimony of a glorious future. There is going to be, he says, that the, the glory of the latter house will exceed the glory of the former. Now, why did God say that? Because God is looking at the Jews and, and, and these guys look very pitiful because they've returned to their land. And they look at their temple, the temple they believed in, their fathers told them about, and the temple is broken down, the walls are broken down, and they are wondering, can we do anything better? God says, not only would you rebuild, but what is yet to be revealed is far greater than what you have ever been. When God brings about a restoration, he doesn't give you equal measure of what you lost. But he gives you good measure, pressed down, shaking together and running over. When God gives you a restoration, he doesn't replace what you lost. He overloads you beyond what you lost. So when God restores, get ready, you are going to a higher level. So there is a testimony of greater glory. The glory of this latter house will be greater. So let's look at the second word, the second prophet and what he said. He says they, prophet, they prospered through the prophesying of Haggai and Zechariah. So let, what does Zechariah say? Now remember both of these were prophets at the same time. There were two prophets who came in and spoke to the situation. Are you ready for it? Okay. So look at Zechariah chapter 4 verse 6 to 9. So he answered and said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Remember, he also says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel you shall become a plain. And he shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands shall also finish it. Then you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. I think that's a good prophecy to receive. What is Zachariah talking about? First, he talks about the supply of grace and anointing. God wanted his people to know the source of their power. He says, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. I supply the grace, I supply the anointing, I supply the power. It's by my spirit. How are you going to enter the open fields? It's by the spirit. The supply of grace and the anointing. The second thing that Zachariah talks about is the subduing of all opposition. Who are you, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? You shall become a plain. Mountain represents exalted systems, power structures, and obstructions in your way. When you want to enter your open field, you're going to find power structures. People who will say, not whilst I'm alive. But God says, who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain. May God subdue every mountain before you. Because you, if you have to have an open field, the dead, there would not have to be mountains in the way. The mountains must become plains. The opposition must be conquered. There must be a plain access for you. 
there is subduing of every opposition. Then third, third thing Zachariah talked to us about is successful completion of projects. Successful completion of projects. He says, the hand of Zachariah has laid the foundation, of Zerubbabel has laid the foundation of this house. The same hand shall complete it. Successful completion of a project. When you start it, you don't only start, but you finish it. Your hands have started that building. Your hands shall also turn the key that opens the door to the rooms. You will not start your building for the building to be uncompleted. Your building will be completed. The factory will be built. The business shall be built. The same hand that starts it shall complete it. Because when God starts with you, he doesn't intend to leave you midstream. God is not in the business of disappointment. He's not in the business of starting and leaving you. What he starts, he's able also to accomplish. So your hand has started it, and your hand shall accomplish it. Everybody look at your hand. It says, these hands have started. These hands shall finish. What does it mean? It also means that you would not die until you have seen the fulfillment of that which God has promised you. So how do we respond to such words when they come to us? We've heard words. We've heard the I am factor. We've heard about the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. We've heard about wealth transfer. The first way to respond to the word of God is first you must discern the word. What does it mean to discern the word? It means you should be able to tell the word of God from the word of man. God's word is spoken through humans. The language is human, but the inspiration is divine. Now you should be able to tell this person is speaking, but at this point, what he's saying is not from him, it's from God. So that's the first thing, discern the word. Second, after you discern the word, the word of God has a way of creating images in your mind. When you hear it, something begins to stir in your spirit, and you begin to see a picture in your mind. You declare the vision. Declare the vision. Make a declaration. Make a confession. And that's why we get people to go around, speak to three people, make a declaration, say this. It's not just a way to make church nice. It's not just a fun way of making church nice. No, it's the second step. You've discerned this is the word of God. You have to declare it. And you have to declare it in a relevant area of your life. So declare the vision. Third, you have to direct your prayer. You have to direct your prayer. The word of God should influence how you pray. You make a declaration, but your prayer must be directed. Because the word has come. You discern it. You declare it, you direct your prayer. Fourth, you determine to win. The word of God must inspire you to win. We must win by the word. So you determine. You're not going to quit. You're not going to surrender. You're going to continue trusting God until final victory is won. Everything that God says to us, every promise he gives us, will be faced with opposition. He told the children of Israel, go to the promised land. And you would have thought that God would have killed all the people before the Israelites got there. But no, Jericho was there with its all wall. The children of the Anak, giants, were there in the land. Goliath and his family were still waiting. So the enemy will not evaporate before you. You're going to contend little by little, but you will possess the land. So you have to be determined to win. You have to keep fighting, and you have to pray, and you have to declare the vision, and you have to discern the word. Thank you for making time to watch Living Word. 